Hi everyone, I'm Casey Havakis, one of the Dairy Management Specialists with Cornell Cooperative Extension's North Country Regional Ag Team. Today I'm joined by my colleague Lindsay Ferlito, as well as Joao Costa, who is an Assistant Professor and Faculty Director of the Dairy Center at the University of Kentucky. Today, Joao is going to discuss some important concepts with, regarding calf nutrition with us. So Joao, why don't you introduce yourself and your research focus a little bit more? Yeah. Thank you so much, Casey. It's a pleasure to be here with you guys and talk about calf nutrition, calf housing in general. So, well, I'm Joel Costa, as you mentioned, and I lead a program, a research program in how to feed, how to house, and pretty much how to raise dairy calves in general, trying to answer the question that we have uh, as an industry. So we've been, especially in the last few years, looking at high, high feeding rates, of milk and different types of concentrate and also how to to house calves in groups and trying to answer those questions that we have on how to transition farms from individual housing to group housing, pair housing in general. I think that has been the core of our research together with how to use technology on dairy farms, especially on dairy cattle in general. So I know that you have a, a couple of questions to ask me about calf housing. So I'll let you do that. So, Joao, you mentioned the idea of higher feeding rates, and there's been a lot of debate over the years about what we should be feeding calves and how much they really need. So how much should we actually be feeding the calf in terms of milk or milk replacer? Well, I think that question always goes back to what is the farm objective and what they are planning to do, but I think it has the minimum as well, right? Like, I think research have been told, telling us or oh, the data has been telling us that five to six liters will be the minimum that a calf would need to maintain, grow, and do the well a little bit, something like a, a gallon and a half. But right now we have farms with objectives of having pretty much the max gain that we can on the first six or 100 days. And that has led some of these producers to have feeding very high feeding rate, very high milk allowance or milk replace allowance to the point of ad libdum, many farms there with two, three, three and a half gallons per day per calf. And uh, we always like try to bring the discussion that is not the amount of milk, it's the solids that is in the milk or the milk replacer that actually influence what these calves are receiving as nutrients. So I, the question is like, what is the objective of the farmer? What they need to do? But we have seen especially when we feed this high amount of milk with a very set and organized uh, diet gains that are much greater than the classic gains of calves from the last decade or so that we use in the industry, calves that are gaining two and a half, three pounds in the first hundred days of life. But the idea of like, what is the amount, how many liters, how many quarts, how many gallons we should be feeding calves, should always fit to the strategy that dairy farmer are using, right? Like, but at the same time, when we find we we talk about feeding calves more milk, we need to talk about how to wean them, how we are going to deliver this milk, uh, what we need to do in general to actually gain the weights that we want. That is more than feed calves is actually what they they use, what like we get as yield from those animals. Great. And I know there's been some concern of some producers when feeding a higher plant of nutrition and feeding more milk of when they can be feeding larger amounts of milk. So how quickly can we increase milk in, in the cast life? Well, lately we have been showing and finding data that actually ramping up, right? That will be that process of giving calves a little bit less milk in the first few days and increase it slowly actually is, n is not necessary. Calves, like, and calves actually in the first two weeks of life have a very high variation of what they will drink, but many of those calves are actually going to drink two, two and a half gallons in the first week of life. However, the consensus is that no calf should be force-fed in any, in any way, right? So even if we are going to offer two gallons, two and a half gallons, like 10 liters of milk, in the first week of life, make sure that some of this milk will go to waste, right? Some of the calves will not be willing or able to drink that amount of milk, but some will, actually a great majority of them will. And we, we find no problem for those animals in general. 
However, when we do that, when we have these plans that we are going to ramp up CAPS, we need to make sure that what the gain of it is that we are not going to waste some of this milk, all the calves will be able, most of the calves will be able to drink that amount. If we are offering, like I would say, if we start with six, seven liters and ramp up to whatever we are hoping for, eight, 10, 12 liters, uh, give at least like two weeks of adaptation for those animals. But I will again say that research has found that that has no benefits in general, besides the benefit of you not wasting some of the milk, but the, the downside of it is that you are limiting some of those animals in this very important time of their life, that the first two weeks that they could gain a little bit more of nutrition or a little bit more of nutrients on, the, on that time. So I particularly, if there isn't a need to save that extra milk, uh, I try to advise the farmers to not do ramp up of the, the amount of milk in the first two weeks of life. Okay, and is there any recommendations on how many times a day calves should be fed if we're going to be feeding them more amounts of milk, um, and how might automatic feeders help achieve that? Yes, so I think the, the easy answer for that is that the automatic feeder really gives us the option to distribute the meals during the day. We know that in our, well, depend the, like when we talk about automated feeders, we are talking about a very broad types of of equipment in general, types of setup. We can control how much milk the calf is allowed to get in each visit, how long between visits, and that also influence the feeding behavior of those animals and how they drink milk. But if we think in general, the automated feed actually give us the possibility to give the calf the chance to come and drink milk when they want, to, at least like very well distributed throughout the day. And calves in, with a normal plan they will drink between five and 10 times per day in meals that will vary there between two and a half and four or five liters, depending on the setup of the feeder. Where obvious that distribute that amount throughout the day, we have like no problem, let's say, or at least less problem feeding behavior abnormalities. But if we are going to feed high amounts of milk, I particularly, well, and a lot of data show that calves can actually drink a lot more milk at once than we, we expected or we hypothesized before feedings of up to five liters at a time, six liters of a time, uh, we've, we have seen no problem whatsoever. So people that are feeding 18 liters a day can easily divide that in two feedings per day without having any sort of issues. But it's always good, like this is like the minimum we can do two feedings a day when we are feeding high amount of milk, but it works much better if we do three times a day, right? And that, especially when the three feedings a day are very well distributed. Well, no, it's hard to do eight hours in between, but at least one feeding that is at least six hours apart from each other. And that, that works really well. However, uh, it's not a problem to feed them twice. One thing that I would say that the way that works on farms very well is that the young calves actually get three feedings and the, the older calves will get two bigger feedings throughout the day. And that I've seen working especially on much bigger farms when they want to do, especially like more than three gallons of milk per day for each animal. So Joao, if calves are being fed these high levels, levels of milk, I imagine the weaning period would be even more stressful for them. So do you have any considerations on how we should be weaning calves when they're fed these high points of nutrition? Well, definitely. So I think that if we look back, the way that we fed calves was always with the objective to wean them, right? We never thought on milk as a way to them. We, we couldn't feed them or we can't to this day feed them solid feed from day one. We need still the, the liquid diet to make that transition between the neonate into a completely weaned animal that, are, uh, that have their diet based on solid feed. So when we reduced as an industry, the amount of milk we fed calves, we were doing that with the objective that calves will, would be more likely, more motivated, more hungry to eat concentrate or solid feed in general. And with that, be weaned at the age that we wanted, right? Like whatever, 40 to 60 days 
as generally we do in the industry. And when we started to feed more, more milk to these calves, obviously we had the problem that they would not be at the same level of solid feed intake at the time that we were hoping for to win them. And many, like obviously from the last more than a decade now, we've been looking at how to win these calves that are in high allowance of, of milk or high, are able to drink more milk in the first, in the first two months of life. And obviously that again goes farm by farm, but has some rule of chain, uh, rule of thumb that we always try to introduce as a SOP for the farm, that is, you need to know what your calves are eating, right? So if you are able to measure that most of your calves are eating at least two to three pounds of solid feed at the time of weaning, that, uh, that means that you have been successful on your weaning program, that the calves are not losing any weight from the day that you stop to reduce milk until the day that, that milk is completely weaned, and especially two weeks after, they are gaining weight again at the same rate that they were on the first month of life so uh, i actually think that this is even a little bit old we need to think that, that calves should gain weight through weaning and we've been able to do that with many uh, diet strategy and especially that none no calf is going under too much of a stress right like through vocalization they are having abnormal intake of pick right like a normal intake of non-nutritive uh, elements like sawdust or plastic in general and you make sure that they're not distressed and how we do that with high fed or high allowance of milk is that we need to respect the time that those calves will take to actually start to eat solid feed so i say and i think most of the data have been very positive that if we do a gradual weaning that is at least three weeks we are giving time for that animal to to start to find, learn, and start to eat solid feed. We need to make sure that those solid feed that we are introducing to these animals are actually of high quality, quality and very palatable, that these animals are actually looking for and will be able to eat. And to make sure that these diets that we are, well, the, the transition that we are making is actually a transition that will support the same growth that or the same amount of nutrients that we are offering before. Obviously, we always will have a little bit of a drop of metabolized energy that we are offering these animals because we are coming from 10, 12, 14 liters of milk that are highly, highly palatable, highly digestible, and now introducing them to a solid feed diet that they are not eating that much, but make that gap or that drop the minimum as possible, right? So try to calculate diets that we actually make sure that the amount of energy that we are offering, or the amount of nutrients in general that we are offering these animals before and after weaning is as plateau as possible. Great, thank you. And given the current dairy outlook and with farms having to decrease production, if farms are feeding whole milk to calves, are they able to extend their milk feeding phase to try to utilize that additional milk? Well, definitely, yeah. So it's a sad time for us that we've been seeing this disruption on the market of milk. And we had many farms that had struggled to take the milk out of the farm, but also a lot of farmers deciding that the price that are, are being paid for milk actually make it worth to take this milk out of the system and put inside of the farm to feed calves. And that's a discussion, it's actually a discussion that I had with many farmers lately, the last month or so, of what is the right age and what are the benefits of extending the milk feeding phase of these animals. And definitely, there is a benefit, like with the age that we decided to wean calves at this point has been almost the most cost effective, right? It's very expensive uh, for us to have calves drinking milk or drinking milk replacer in general. And that's the reason of milk replacer or was at least the, the reason of milk replacer to try to cut some of this cost. So extending the milking phase actually makes weaning, makes even the transition general for the calves much easier. And the age that we decided now that is between 40 to 60 days, almost like the minimum that we can do to feed calves and still have a pretty good growth, a pretty good development of that animal. So every time we extend it, make it easier to, to do 
things to the animals to transition them into diets to to actually have less less of a problem through weaning. Uh, many farms, and I think it's very common is still that many farms will do 75, 80, 90 days of a milk feeding time, a milk feeding period, and that makes like yeah, life much easier in general. One thing that I always suggest is that we also don't want to have a plateau of milk intake because it's good and uh, early development of the rumen is still interesting, it's still a positive thing for the calf in general. So when you get that, if you the way, in my opinion, that works the best, and I, we are doing some research looking at it, is that you extend the gradual weaning of these animals instead of extending the time that they are on full allowance. So if you have a calf that is going to be weaned in 90 days, instead of just do three weeks of gradual weaning, now you have time to do five or six weeks where you every week ramp down the amount of milk for that animal. So where you, where, what you gain have more time is that things only have to be rushed, right? You are able to gain more intake of solid feed. You are able to control and actually measure it for, for much longer. You are able to get actually the slow doer, right? The calves that are not doing as great to be able to have a much longer transition and by 90, by 100 days, they'll be, they'll be doing much, much better. But at the same point, at the same time, we need to make sure, like when we decide that as a farmer, we decide that as a consultant, we need to make sure that the farm has the space, the ability, and especially the time to do that extra work, right? Like we, it's very time consuming and expensive to feed calves as well. I know that even having the free milk, we still have to deliver that milk to the animals, clean the, that equipment, having those calves housed on for much longer and that's a consideration that also needs to be made right it's not just about having milk it's about like do we have time and the effort and the the cost that it will bring to the farm is actually viable and profitable but yes it's a it's a major thing and with that actually i think there are a lot of farms are deciding to change or to transition from milk replacer to whole milk in this phase and I think that has been a good thing, but well, even when milk replacer got much expensive than milk in many situations, the whole milk in many situations, we need to make sure that that is also being delivered correctly, right? Like pasteurization or cleaning of the equipments, make sure that the transport, the time that this whole milk sits is also very important and, and needs to be observed on farm when we make the transition. And you briefly covered this already, but are there any other type of benchmarks that farms should be looking at when deciding to wean their calves? Well, I try to apply that to all the farms that we work with. I think it's very important. Calf data is still very underlooked, in my opinion. And the three, I think the initially, the initial three benchmarks that should be used to wean calves, at least to uh, have an opinion of how the weaning of the animals are working on your farm is to make sure that those animals are actually having a ramp up that is slowly and steadily through weaning. So the the rule of thumb, and that depends the size of the animal, the breed, uh, what is being offered to them. But like a, for very long at the field, we are talking about two to three pounds of solid feed at the moment that milk is, is not made available as well, I actually particularly with calves that have been drinking high allowance of milk, I try to get to the, to the four pounds of solid feed at the time of that milk is completely taken away from those animals. And I think that's a very, very strong benchmark. But the most important I always think is the animals, right? Like, the second benchmark that we try to see is exactly that. If we divide uh, the milk feeding period from neonates to the day that we are reducing milk, the day that we start to reduce milk until complete wind, and from the day of complete weaning and two weeks after, those three times should have like very similar growth rates in general. I think if we are achieving that, that is exactly a, a good thing especially throughout the when we start to reduce milk. I think that's uh, one of the, the great ways for us to, 
to observe if the winning transition is actually going smoothly through through time that those animals should be gaining weight but at least should not should be gaining weight at the rate that they sh they were gaining before but for sure they shouldn't be uh, losing any weight on that time and i think that was something that we we still see commonly on our farms then the third benchmark that i really like to use on farms is that farms that have records of treatment records of disease is that we shouldn't see a ramp up of those events around winning and it's for well, mortality as well. We shouldn't be seeing any of that happening throughout the two weeks prior to two to three weeks after weaning and that we should be seeing a plateau of those events on farm. And I think using those three benchmark at the beginning, we are able to have an idea that is my weaning program working? Are my calves growing? Are my calves getting sick or too stressed uh, throughout that time? Great, thank you, Joao. So hopefully by now we've convinced some listeners to at least consider feeding some more milk or milk replacer. But I think probably some of them are wondering, you know, how would they go about doing it? If they don't have an automatic feeder, is this still feasible for them? So what are some other approaches that, that farmers have taken in terms of either like pair housing or group housing and not having to purchase an automatic feeder and still being able to feed more milk? Yeah. Well, I think that many times those decisions end up coming together, right? Like people come out of the traditional way to feed calves and are looking into having well, greater rates of growth and some sort of group housing, some sort of uh, complex social housing in general. Sometimes they are separate, especially I think have a lot more farms nowadays feeding high allowance of milk than in pair or group housing. but Together, I think they they also come as a decision in many farms. And a lot of questions that we get is like, well, how we are, we can do it without having and even individual house? How can we feed more milk if you know even my bottles are two quarts and things like that? And I really think that there are many options out there. And the options that we've seen and doing more and more is obviously for group housed. The wind, uh, the automated feeders is the most obvious one, but has many ways to feed calves with more feeders. I think more in the market, more and more, we have those two, four, six, even greater uh, mob feeders that work really well and are very easy to clean. Many of them, I think milk, like some of those mobile distributors of, of milk that also pasteurize whole milk have been, and that have become, very, very common uh, in the industry in general. And I think more and more what is happening, especially to larger units, is that we are making group house pens where all the calves have a headlock or some sort of feeding space in general that they come and actually are fed individually. And those alternatives are becoming more and more common. Farmers are becoming very creative of how to do it. And I think that will gain space on our industry in general is a, is a very cheap or cost effective way to do so. Obviously, we lose the data that comes, we lose some of the abilities that the automated feeder come, and I still think that that's a farm by farm decision, but there are many ways to do so. And especially to do even just feed calves more milk, I think there are many alternatives out there from bigger bottles or or buckets with teats attached to it that make it like almost very, very similar to feed four liters or one, one gallon of milk per day to those animals. Well, thank you, Joao, for sharing those really great suggestions. I know Lindsay and I certainly appreciate you taking the time to chat with us today. And I really think our listeners will be able to take many valuable points away from this. So we hope that you're able to enjoy some of the nice weather that we're finally getting and we hope to chat again soon. So thank you again very, very much. Well, again, thank you, Jason Lindsay, for the invitation. And I would like to open my contact and I think we'll be shared with the video, but costa at uky.edu. It's my email, I'll be happy to answer any question that any listener may have. And you know, like you guys as well. Thank you very much for the space and I will be happy to participate in the future.